Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. In this video, we're going to continue the Through the Ages series, where we take a nostalgic look back at how Age of Empires 2 civilizations have evolved between their original design and today. This time, we have an especially interesting one in the Koreans. They're undoubtedly one of the most changed civilizations over the years, not just in terms of the total number of tweaks, but the fact they've had an almost unprecedented redesign from the ground up, transitioning from being a broken onager to a broken tower to a pretty terrible archer civilization, with a recent revival just in the last few months. Even the choice of Koreans for the game has a very interesting backstory, which we will get to. But first let's start by setting up the context. Age of Kings was released in September 1999, and after its success, Ensemble Studios was tasked with coming up with a follow-up expansion. Led by designer Sandy Peterson, the concept or theme of the expansion was to represent various conquerors through history, which included Huns, Spanish, and Aztecs, with Mayans thrown in as they had already made all the architecture and art for the Aztecs and wanted to get a bit more mileage out of it. This was the intention, with Koreans not even considered, right up until a handful of weeks before release when something happened. According to Sandy Peterson, who both gave contemporary interviews as well as a recent one on a podcast, somewhere between six or eight weeks before Age of Conquerors deadline, Microsoft went to the team and said you have to include Koreans. The reason was StarCraft 1 had sold so well in Korea that Microsoft wanted its RTS to compete. One estimate I've seen is that of StarCraft's 9 to 10 million units sold, roughly half of those sales were in South Korea. Peterson's very funny response was that StarCraft didn't have Koreans in it, so Microsoft's entire premise was flawed from the start. And indeed, sales in Korea for the AOE2 expansion didn't seem to have been boosted by the inclusion. Yet, the orders from the top were Koreans were going to be added to AOE2 at the last minute. The rush to include Koreans on top of the existing new civilizations and technologies already planned apparently led to a few errors, according to Peterson, including the turtle ships not looking quite right and the oversight of mistranslating the Sea of Japan real-world map to Sea of Japan in Korean which is a whole can of worms, but basically North and South Korea are adamant it should be called either the EC or Korean EC, and is a big enough dispute to have its own Wikipedia page. In a video I made a few years ago about the real world maps that brought up the Sea of Japan map, Peterson shared he'd heard secondhand that this mistranslation was considered so offensive that the police began to make trouble and threatening to arrest the representative in Seoul, though Peterson admits this is again all secondhand information. Funny enough, the idea of including the target audience as a civilization has seemingly been tried again very recently with the Vietnamese being added to the Return of Rome expansion, presumably to try to appeal more to Vietnamese players who make up the current majority of the AOE1 fanbase. If the Return of Rome unranked lobby is any indication though, much like Koreans in the Conquerors expansion, it doesn't seem to have had the intended effect. Controversies aside though, now let's take a look at Koreans as they appeared in mid-2000 when the Conquerors expansion dropped. Originally, their team bonus was that Mangonels and Onagers had plus one range, Villagers had plus two line of sight, Stone Miners worked 20% faster, Tower upgrades were free, though you still needed chemistry for Bombard Tower, and the Watchtower line had plus one range in Castle Age, and another plus one in Imperial, on top of Bracer, for a maximum range of eight plus five. Their unique tech, which remember there was only one of back then, gave plus two more range to Mangonels and Onagers, for a total of eight plus four with Siege Engineers. This was pretty clearly a tower, siege, and naval civilization, and decent but not amazing archers. The main design idea was Koreans were going to have a powerful but expensive army, probably best exemplified by their unique units. Both trained slowly and were undeniably on the more expensive end, but could win one-on-one -on -one against most things they encountered. The turtle ship was of course inspired by its famous use by Koreans against the Japanese, while the war wagon and onager bonuses are seemingly a reference to the Koreans' use of watches, which were a cart-based artillery that fired dozens or hundreds of arrows, very similar to the Chinese nest of bees in AOE 4, though it is credited to the Koreans. Now both of these unique units have had quite a few tweaks over the years, and originally war wagons were 80 wood and 60 gold, cheaper than they are now, they had one more range and did four bonus damage against ramps, with archers being their greatest specialty thanks to high HP and armor. Even the very first patch after Conquerors came out suggested they thought they were a little too strong initially, raising their wood cost by 50% and reducing their range to its current value. At this point though, we should probably take a minute and talk about the Korean Siege Onagers, as people who didn't play back in Age of Conquerors probably don't realize how broken they were. Siege Onagers started out with 8 range, but got plus 1 from a team bonus, plus 2 from their unique tech, and another plus 1 from Siege Engineers, for a total of 12. 
If that isn't immediately setting off red flags, for reference, a castle with bracer has 11 range, so you are getting siege onagers with the range of a longbowman. Obviously, it's expensive to get there, but that clearly wasn't going to stay in the game for very long. In fact, the very early patch that nerfed war wagons also included a nerf to their unique tech, so that it only gave plus one instead of plus two range, which at least meant fully upgraded castles could fire back. This is where Koreans stood for over a decade, with a reputation of being very good on Black Forest or closed maps when allowed to boom, with a death bolt composition of siege onagers, war wagons, and halberdiers. Keep in mind, aside from good population efficiency, siege onagers were needed to cut trees, meaning Koreans or one of the other five civilizations with siege engineers were basically a necessity on a Black Forest team game. Outside of Black Forest though, the reputation was quite poor, as the only thing their early game had going for it was towers. And as one data point, in 2014, Zero Empires made a video of the worst civilizations at the time, putting Koreans as number three. Funny enough, that was one position ahead of Franks, if you can believe that now. Though Franks are not the same now as they were back then, as covered in another video in this series. At this point, towers mostly defined Koreans' reputation on open maps, which made for very messy games that some players didn't like. Still, it was their identity, and the earliest expansions actually tried to double down on that tower motif. The first round of these changes came in the Forgotten expansion of 2013, aiming initially to make their unique units more popular while also focusing on defenses. It included a new bonus where Koreans built fortifications 33% faster, a new unique tech in Castle Age giving turtle ships plus 15% movement speed, and the amazing team bonus for plus one mangonel range was replaced with a smaller minimum range. I don't want to speak for everyone, but I think a lot of people did share my opinion these changes made Koreans worse for everyone involved. First, long range onagers for your whole team was incredibly fun, even if occasionally broken, and the devs killed the party by taking it away. Second, tower rushes were frankly annoying to play against, now made even more annoying by the fact aggressive Korean towers were usually built faster than your defensive response towers, even if you had more villagers building yours. Throw in the extra tower range in Castle Age, free upgrade to guard tower for more attack and HP, faster stone mining, and even extra villager line of sight, everything cried out for Koreans to tower rush, and that's exactly what everyone did. If they weren't already, Koreans were definitely the tower rush civilization, especially after the Forgotten. The next expansion, African Kingdoms, then brought some pretty small changes for the most part, with the devs seemingly happy with where the Koreans were sitting. This is when War Wagons gained Cavalry Archer armor, which maybe went a little under the radar and made them go from taking 50 elite skirmisher javelins to 34, so skirmishers became a significantly larger threat. Probably the biggest change to Koreans at this point though was the addition of arrow slits, which made their towers even more potent and also made them uniquely the only civilization to have the entire university tech tree available. The next expansion, Rise of the Rajas and its accompanying patch, seemingly backtracked and finally nerfed the Koreans' very unpopular towers. First, it made all towers cost more wood, and second, reduced the Koreans' 33% faster construction of fortifications to 5% for towers specifically. While the full 33% still applied to castles, suddenly they weren't getting their towers up faster than defenders consistently. And arguably around this time, Incas were becoming the scarier tower rushing civilization, with villagers benefiting from blacksmith upgrades being used to full effect. So far though, compared to civilizations like Franks, it felt like most of their changes were pretty tame, and trying to make the Korean towers viable without being oppressive. Really though, in a meta dominated increasingly by crossbows and knights, Koreans were doing pretty poorly after their nerf. For example, in my worst civilizations video of 2019, looking at the online win rates, Koreans were the seventh worst, doing all right in quick games with their tower rushes, but otherwise not looking that great. Unfortunately, their worst performing days were yet to come, but at this point, the devs switched tactics and wanted to make Koreans a more quote, normal civilization, pushing them toward the archer meta and less reliant on towers as a gimmick. This would involve a complete shift in their identity, and an avalanche of changes came in Definitive Edition, which I'll separate into three categories. First, their defenses, and especially towers, were nerfed across the board. Their faster built fortification bonus was scrapped entirely, and their bonus of extra range on towers in Castle and Imperial was made into their Castle Age unique tech, pushing them away from towers by locking a prior free bonus behind a technology and a castle you have to build first. At the same time, towers also dropped in HP from 1,020 to 700 in Feudal Age, though bump back up to 850 HP later, with the net effect of just making tower rushing more difficult in general. Offsetting this and as part of their redesign, they then had to gain an archer specialty. 
Initially, they gained a 15% wood discount on all non-siege units, but this was soon increased to 20%, though today this bonus sits at minus 50% wood cost for archers and infantry, with the minus 20% save for warships. Also reinforcing this new archer identity, they were given the archer armor upgrades for free. Considering their fully upgraded art blasters, suddenly they were clearly an archer civilization. Though interestingly, this didn't seem to help Koreans all that much by win rate, and very consistently after the switch to an archer identity, they were in the bottom 5 by online performance, which was still true up until just this last June, when the minus 50% wood discount was added. On top of these land changes, a third angle of attack to bring new life to Koreans was to their water play, and especially their unique unit. First, their prior unique tech, speeding up turtle ships, was just given to them for free, making them permanently 15% faster. More recently, they were also given plus one range when elite, and are now affected by siege engineers, while also costing significantly less wood than they originally did. At this point, it definitely feels they fill the role they were intended to as a population efficient tank on water, though their other warships are also now discounted 20% in their wood cost, and they've gained elite cannon galleon, so they're really not hurting for different options. War wagons, on the other hand, have had their base cost adjusted, so they're only slightly cheaper than they were in the past, now at 100 wood instead of the 110 they cost in the Forgotten expansion. And their biggest hit taken was definitely the extra bonus damage from elite skirmishers. This weakness was made even worse in Dynasties of India, where they now have negative 1 cavalry archer armor. They're definitely a little weaker than they were at release, but are still considered part of the Koreans' ultimate death ball composition when you can get a large mass of them. But that's where the Koreans stand today. As I mentioned, they were actually doing quite poorly for the past few years despite a handful of archer bonuses, and for whatever reason on the latter, the wood discount and free archer armor never translated into them having a lot of success as an archer civilization. That said, most recently with the change from a 20% to a 50% wood discount, they've shown a lot more life, almost out of the bottom third of civilizations by ladder win rate. In fact, they're actually quite a respectable early game Civ now, and in contrast to their original design, it's instead the late game where they seem to struggle, at least in 1v1 open maps. Of course, the tower rush part of their identity is also extremely toned down, with archers being clearly their most popular and successful opening, though men-at-arms and towers are still a reasonable choice. Maybe surprisingly, at this point, King Game Black Forest isn't a particularly strong map for Koreans, and even Amazon Tunnel isn't as good as I would have expected given their very strong onagers, war wagons, bomber towers, discounted fully upgraded arbalesters, and super cheap trash units, at least in terms of their wood cost. Though I have to believe if they got their 12 range siege onagers back, they'd be doing a lot better. Instead, it seems Nomad is their specialty at the moment, with towers and a solid navy probably being major contributors. Overall, it's been quite a ride for Koreans over the years, and they're probably in the best spot they've ever been, but I would happily sign any petition someone starts to bring back their original team bonus. That'll do it for this one though. Thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time.